Grand Archive TCG's first major event, Ascent Houston, with about a 207 player main event, took place just a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm finally all recovered from it, and uh, what we're going to do in this video is talk a little bit about sort of the new meta game, because as this was the first major event, the sort of the top eight sort of dictated what I think a lot of people are going to start gravitating towards and building their decks to beat. So specifically what we're going to look at is the uh, top deck list from the event, and we're going to actually look at not only sort of their place in the meta game, how they play and how they succeeded, we're also going to be looking at the price of playing the top decks in Grand Arc. And spoiler alert, there are a number of top tier decks that are quite cost effective for a competitive TCG. So without any further ado, we're going to look at the top eight, actually the top nine decks from Grand Archive Ascent Houston 2023. Let's jump into it. What's up everyone, it's Dan with Main Deck with another Grand Archive video and as I mentioned in the intro today we're going to be talking about the top upper echelon of decks from Ascent Houston 2023. Not quite the top 8 because if you missed the last video um, I did post a full video going over my ninth place deck profile. I did bubble out with a record that would make it into top cut but my tiebreakers were not quite there. Despite that, I think the deck we played deserves a uh, discussion in the metagame, so I am including it in this today, but um, from the top cut of Ascent Houston, we actually saw uh, some incredible results. The the amazing Team Troop Champion Gaming got three players into the top eight playing the exact same list, which is going to cut down a little bit of the time we have to spend going into different lists in this one because they're all just the same list. Uh, likewise, there were two of the exact same Fire Merlin deck lists in the top cut, and then a couple, a few other decks that we're going to go over, plus uh, the deck, I'm going to go a much shorter version of the sort of deep dive I did previously on the Fire Lorraine, uh, Fire Merlin, Fire Hybrid, triple threat deck that main deck played at the event as well. Um, in addition to all that, I want to talk about the price to play. So without any further ado, let's jump in. We're going to look at the very first deck list here. All right, and here we are with... Kaben, Schwartz, and Truber, or actually just full team uh, True Champion Gaming's deck list. They, again, there were three True Champion Gaming players who all made it in a top cut. So huge shout out to Kaben, Isaac, and Terry for your incredible performance with this super off meta deck um, with a lot of interesting card choices. I, I believe they said in their discussion they, they couldn't believe they were bringing a pile like this to Ascent. And I mean, clearly their, their practice experience and meta call really showed here. So um, let's jump in really briefly. So this isn't going to be like a full deck profile on all these decks. I'm just going to talk very briefly about each of these decks and a little bit of their strengths and weaknesses that we saw. Um, I had a ton of fun at Ascent Houston because I actually got to commentate uh, the final round. You can check that out. We'll have a link in the description to TM32's coverage of uh, the top eight. And in the final match, the finals, uh, it was the mirror match between Kaven and Isaac. I got to commentate that along with Alan Fan uh, from the Weaves of the Shore team. And it was super fun just to talk about these decks as they played. But basically what you're looking at here is a Wind Lorraine deck only goes to level two. We are not going to level three here. Um, and it is just pure ally aggro. Guys, you're playing Banner Knights, Gildas, a bunch of just things you can play. Ace and Protector with the Squirrels, which is obviously the Squirrels being a critical component of like doing Gildas math. Um, full suite of Phalanx Captains, Dream Fairies, because Dream Fairies get rid of deer and all sorts of other problems. Um, and yeah, things just like, things like Windrider, Vanguard, and Lurking Assailant just to be bodies on the board. Um, and then the rest of the package, there's, I believe there's 40 allies. Yeah, there's 40 allies in this deck. Um, and then... Uh, some inspiring calls and a tune with the winds to pump the team. We have some deflecting edge, which helps against the sort of the fast fire aggro decks or can be used to preserve your like Gildas when your opponent's trying to get rid of it. Um, we have favorable winds, another card that helps you just preserve your board. And then occasionally that floating memory will get you some value. Um, displace, which actually was really clutch in the finals, watching dis being displaces being used to reset dream fairies to hit key targets so that they could try and like you know, posture around each other and, and get around the opponent's uh, defenses that they're trying to throw up. And then Rally in Advance, a card that I think a lot of people have totally written off, but was a, a key card during the day just for getting uh, like untaps on Gildas just to get extra damage in Ace and Protector or to attack with Ace in and then wake it up so that it can intercept on the next turn, keeping your defense up as you're pushing damage. I mean, tons of reasons that this card actually was being very cool uh, the whole day. So 
Um, that's the basics of this deck. In the material deck, it's running the, the thing a lot of aggro decks are doing, which is a very smart thing to do. Um, all three baubles in the main board, so you always have two rings each game, Grand Crusader ring plus another card draw, depending on what element your opponent's playing. Um, and then uh, just some tech pieces, Tariff Ring in the aggro matchup, Tithe against Rai, uh, just some useful things and some swords for Lorraine to grab. The Crystal of Empowerment um, might look a little bit unusual, uh, but the Crystal actually is cool for turning on that Banner Knight when you're still just level one. I believe that's kind of like the the primary use of it, at least that's how we saw it being used as well um, throughout the day. So that's a that's a pretty cool little trick just to be able to have that, you know, I don't want to spend the cards to go to Lorraine 2, but I do want to be able to just get some Banner Knights online and push that aggro while I'm on level 1. Because the big thing, of course, in Grand Archive is as you level up, you lose your cards. So aggro decks really want to stay lower to the ground so they can keep uh, keep the cards flowing. And then a sideboard is just full of just full of tech. Like whatever you need, you got in here. Swap in the Quicksilver for the Grand Crusader's Ring if you need to get out a tithe and protect it or get out a Nullifying Lantern and protect it. Um, some trinkets, some Clarent for board wipey stuff, smoke bombs to get rid of interceptors or to protect your own Gildas. Uh, poison Coating Oil, a cool card that um, can get your like dream fairies to do a little extra damage. Um, I believe there is, yeah, there's uh, also the combo of using smoke bombs with poison coating oil to get a bigger swing on something. It's some little combos you can string in here just to, just to find a bunch of extra damage there. So very cool deck. Uh, shout out again to True Champion Gaming. You guys did an incredible job. What a showing. Really showed everyone um, the place in the meta. Now, I think in the meta game going forward, this is going to be a deck to beat. Obviously, this is a deck that has a lot of potency. It is not too complicated to pilot. I mean, you you can say that, but actually, if you watch that final match, the decisions were so intense, the amount of math you have to do to get Gildas there, but it is still ultimately a straightforward sort of like find the line to deal damage and attack. Um, so it is not by any stretch a brainless deck, but it is at least a little more straightforward, streamlined, like I know what my game plan is and I'm going to execute it uh, kind of deck. So um, I think you're going to want to, if you're building decks for the upcoming like store championship regional metagame, this is a deck you have to keep in mind. Um, it's, it's very much a, if you can't beat it, you should play it. You need to decide like one of the two routes to go. And I, I think this is going to be sort of our baseline wind aggro deck that, um, that if your deck is cold to it, you're going to want to reconsider that deck choice or figure out how to attack against it, uh, in the new metagame. Um, if nothing else, because three were in the top eight and Caben was the winner with this deck of Ascent, so it has already proven its power level. So now let's jump in and let's talk a little bit about uh, the price of this deck. All right, now as you can see here, and I'm doing this for all the deck lists we're looking at today, I've actually pulled up a full deck list on TCG Player already, and we'll have links in the description down below that will automatically take you to the full deck list to load into your cart. And then of course, make sure you use the cart optimizer to get the best price. If you do wanna just pick up the full deck in one go and start playing Grand Archive competitively that way, as a note, this is using our TCG player affiliate link. Link for that in, in the description if you just wanna pick up individual singles or something as well. And buying through TCG player, using that affiliate link will support main deck as well. And of course, we greatly appreciate any support you'll give us. It doesn't cost you anything extra. You're still getting the same, you know, uh, market prices that TCG player offers. Um, but we're trying to make it easy on you guys with those links down below. And it just, you know, it helps us out, which is really awesome. So for this list, and actually for a number of these lists, a really cool thing about Grand Archive right now is that there are some fairly cost-effective deck lists that are like absolute, like you're not even budget, you're not even uh, given anything up for the budget, top tier deck lists. Um, so this deck clocks in at 149.89 after I use the cart optimizer on it. Uh, and you'll see, I mean, the, the whole thing is in here. Now that price mostly comes from uh, the Grand Crusaders ring and the Quicksilver amulet, and then these Gildas down here. Um, Gildas is a card that has seen some price increases after Caben's list, uh, True Champion Gaming's list came out and um, just caused people to want to get a lot more Gildas's. But I think they're, you're starting to see some more come back into the market that are at a little bit more of an affordable price here. We have a couple that are at $23 per Gildas, um, but I believe somewhere in the cart we have some that are a little bit cheaper. Uh, here we go. Yeah, so we have a $10 and a $7 one right in the cart here too. So... Um, those are really the bulk of the price right there. We're talking 35 for Grand Crusaders Ring, 
We're talking another 40 for the Gildases. If you happen to have that stuff already, you do not have to spend much. You probably have this whole deck, honestly. Uh, you might need a Quicksilver Grail for 10 bucks, And again, that's a sideboard piece. So um, if you just want to start playing the deck and figure out your sideboard later, you don't have to buy that. Um, a lot of the stuff, though, look how cheap. They're just commons. They're easy, easy cards to get. You're not paying a lot for any of this stuff. So clocks in about 150 bucks. Again, the link to buy that deck is down in the description if you just want to Boom, pick it up, just a few clicks, make sure to optimize your cart, and you are good to go. So the next list we are looking at is Jimmy Lee's Fire Lorraine deck, and I can say from a personal experience, this deck did beat me up um, in the uh, in the top cut day two, uh, trying to get into the top eight and the top 32, I did face Jimmy. We had a we had a very good match, but his deck just, it pulled off the blazing throws. It did the damage to me. This is a classic Fire Lorraine swing for huge damage deck. The kind of deck that you generally want to bring in Nullifying Lantern against, but it doesn't necessarily matter that much because he's also just going to throw out Arthurs and Strapping Conscripts and just do a bunch of damage to you. So um, you're, you're going to see when we look at the price, of course, the, most of the price comes from Arthur in this deck. Otherwise, a lot of the stuff is fairly cheap. We're looking at just your bog standard sort of fire creatures that you run. Varrican Acolyte, Flame Rune Swordsman, Hasty Messenger, Strapping Conscript if you're playing aggro. Clumsy Apprentice only runs two of this. Four Scavenging Raccoon. This thing was doing work against, I'm sure, everyone all day, but especially the deck we were playing um, as it's going to banish things from the discard pile. So it's great in the mirror match against the other Fire Lorraine decks also. Um, we are running the level two Lorraine, which I think is the right call. Some of these decks only run level one, but I think having that level two for that extra plus two damage is very critical. Again, it's an aggressive deck, so it's running all three bobbles. Um, and then for your big, big damage kills, you have Rending Flames, you have Fiery Momentum, you have, uh, and then of course you have uh, the Blazing Throw to finish it off, and the Hone by Fire to make that Rending Flames just take someone out right away. Um, this deck is not running any increasing dangers, so it's going to be a little tougher for it to pull off like turn two kills. Um, I uh, maybe is possible with cremation rituals into clumsy still. I think I'd have to do the math on that. Um, but it certainly can kill you very fast out of nowhere, even if it can't necessarily hit you on turn two. I mean, that blazing throw does add quite a bit of damage to make that happen as well. Um, one thing about this deck, and, and a thing that I think is really smart, is that Jimmy did main board four, main, four flame sweeps. And the very interesting thing about that is that um, I believe Jimmy actually lost to the deck that this main board flame sweep would be super, super good against the deck we just looked at, the Win Lorraine deck from True Champion Gaming. Um, so I don't know. I didn't get to see that matchup. I'm not sure if Jimmy just, uh, missed drawing them or something. Uh, but I can imagine if you see those flame sweeps and you get to that Lorraine level two, um, that should spell a lot of damage for your opponent. Uh, a lot, a lot of damage to your opponent and a lot of allies gone and draw a bunch of cards and it should make it pretty easy for you to win that game. Um, so very unfortunate. I think that Jimmy didn't quite make it because I do think he's favored in that matchup with this in mind. But that said, you know, that just shows the resiliency of that Win Lorraine deck and its ability to push out damage just as fast as this Fire Lorraine deck can. Um, and the big thing about Fire is that Fire just doesn't have a lot of ways to interact. So um, if Win Lorraine starts, gets a good start and starts pushing damage, all it can really do is try and kill the allies and stabilize. But for this Lorraine deck, that's not necessarily where you want to be playing the game. You kind of want to, it's faces the place kind of game. You want to just get that damage in and take the opponent out of the game if possible. Uh, other random tech cards, he does running smoke bombs. Again, you have to have the smoke bombs because if your opponent goes quickly to a Merlin level three and drops a Majestic Spirit, which we'll talk about in some of these later decks, smoke bombs to give it stealth to make it unable to intercept. Stealth units are unable to intercept units that don't have true sight. Uh, so, uh, because it would be an illegal, it would be an illegal attack. Um, so smoke bombs is very, very critical for getting rid of an interceptor like that. And of course, as usual, also can be used to like protect an Arthur or something as needed. Um, and out of the sideboard, um, I think some interesting choices in here, and I'd love to talk to Jimmy. I'm, I'm probably going to pull him up in the discord or something and just ask what's going on because, uh, I, I love the, the clumsy apprentice in here. I guess there are some matchups where he decided he wants a little more draw, um, and the Orb of Regret, I really want to know when he brings in Orb of Regret because Lorraine is generally such a 0 to 60, like get in there and, and do damage to the opponent that um, I my my assumption is that uh, you'd bring this in, in in games where you absolutely need to see particular cards. Either you need to go fast, 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 um, and it's you're going to get an opening hand that just doesn't have your Rending Flames combo or maybe, you know, against this uh, True Champion gaming build, 
bringing in the Orb of Regret to just to try and dig for flame sweeps could be a critical play. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. Maybe if Jimmy watches this, maybe he'll go in and comment down below because I'm very curious about these. But otherwise, uh, I I'm definitely want to ask about some of these choices because they're, they're quite interesting, I think. Um, but yeah, that's that deck. So let's go ahead and let's look at what do you think the price is going to be for this little deck here? So pulling up Jimmy's list on uh, our TCG player mass entry form and then optimizing it, we have actually what is the cheapest deck list of the event, uh, clocking at $139.00. Um, and again, if you have Ring, if you have Arthur, this is just, you're going to have the deck, basically. That's where most of the price comes from. A little bit on the Varix, not really much. Um, but yeah, I mean, things like Rending Flames is $2. These are actually supporter pack Rending Flames that got optimized in here. Uh, they're not expensive at all, and you're going to get cool looking ones. Um, super cheap commons. Hasty Messengers are 2 bucks a pop. Uh, there's that $35 Grand Crusader Ring, another $4 Varric. Um, but yeah, commons, commons, commons. Here are the Arthurs. Arthur's sitting at $12 for four. That's actually $12 each for four, 48 total. That's not bad at all. Um, that's cheaper than Gildas's. Uh, and then a lot of the stuff is just there's some rares that you have to pay a little bit for. Or we'll regret a couple bucks for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, price is just, price is not crazy at all here. Very reasonable. Uh, $140 for a top tier competitive deck list that I, I honestly, a deck that I think could have won a cent. Maybe if Jimmy's card draw had just kind of come up right in that, um, in that last match he was in, that's gotta be pretty reasonable to play. I think, uh, someone who comes from a lot of TCGs, 140 for a top quality deck is pretty crazy. That's a, that's a wonderful deal. So, um, again, if you want to check that out, link is going to be down in the description to either buy it in one shot or just hit up our affiliate link, pick up the singles you need and, uh, Go on with your day. Have a good day and uh, feel good about helping main deck out. All right. So next we are looking at Sean Zhang's Fire Rye deck. Now this was the lone Fire Rye deck to make it into the top eight. And there are several reasons for that. I think number one, the prevalence of these powerful aggro decks. We just looked at Wind Lorraine and Fire Lorraine, both decks that have a good matchup against Rye because they're able to go very fast and are hard to deal with, especially like the Wind Lorraine versus Fire Rye matchup because Sean's fire list here has a lot of really good tech, but does not play any of the board wipes that he would need to really get some leverage against fire eye and is going to have a, uh, against win the rain is going to have a little bit of an easier time. I would imagine against the fire Lorraine because it puts less onboard pressure in play and is just reliant uh, a little bit more on getting some big fiery momentum and rending flame swings and resolute stand does a lot of work against that as do the peaceful reunions out of the sideboard. Um, so aggro decks that just, if he doesn't see these and the aggro decks draw their stuff, they just kind of walk all over him and makes it a little bit of a difficult matchup. But, uh, I also think that fire eye is just a trickier deck to play. You have to get your math exactly right. And you're really living on a razor's edge as to whether or not you can kind of string that combo together to win. Um, or if you just kind of get walked over. So um, if you're unfamiliar with fire eye deck, it is a very straightforward build. I'm not going to go too in depth here. Um, it runs a million arcane cards. This one runs somewhere close to 30. I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, four dungeon guides because you're trying to go as fast as possible. Your goal is to get to level three with a few cards in hand and then just start comboing off using careful study to get extra draws, peer into mana to get a lot of cards. The combination of powerful power overwhelming peer into mana or power overwhelming scry the skies to either get like 17 enlightened counters on your champion and draw a million cards Scry the Skies for like 15 cards and just find your careful studies and kind of keep going off. Arcane Disposition uh, to draw a bunch of cards and then Reckless Conversion to take all your memory back in your hand and keep going with your turn until you can ultimately Arcane Blast and Fireball your way to victory. So that's the basic of the deck. Um, the, the material deck is very straightforward. I really like the choice of running Quicksilver Grail in the material deck. Very, very clutch, very cool plays you can make using Tome of Knowledge by playing it during your main phase instead of during material phase using Quicksilver Grail, baiting the opponent into answering the Quicksilver Grail, um, or just using Quicksilver with Nullifying to ensure you can put a bit of a damper on the opponent running Erupting or Rending Flame strategies. Um, Chalice of Blood here, punishing the opponent if they push you to 20 life but don't kill you. Very strong play against those aggro decks that are going to just not necessarily quite get there if their hand isn't optimal. Um, and then you come back with way too many cards on your turn to then combo off and get your opponent. Love all those choices there. Um, some interesting sideboard choices here too. Some obvious ones like Peaceful Reunion and the Fourth Resolute Stand make a ton of sense because you have to bring these in against aggro. The Grand Crusader's Ring, which they bring in, I guess, in matchups where... 
The Quicksilver is not as useful as just seeing another card. I'm not totally sure which matchups Sean bring this, brings this in against. I'd be really interested to hear from him about that. Um, another power overwhelming. Uh, I also wonder when he brings this in. I would assume there are some matchups where the combos are a little more important um, to try and, and get higher levels. Maybe maybe there are matchups where it's, they're going to like be manipulating his his memory so he's not banishing as many arcane cards or something i'm not totally sure that's kind of, this is an interesting this is an interesting card in here i don't know when that comes in and likewise i think the conduit's a very fascinating card to bring in here too um the conduit's kind of cute uh, you, you could pitch it to creative shock and use the floating memory but it doesn't give Stormseer the level buff so it's not actually that good there but i i would assume this is here for when the opponent's going full in on trying to stop spell damage with blanches or something. And the conduit gives you a way to push attack damage in instead, because you could certainly get a lot of swings with conduit off um, when you start comboing with your careful studies and your peer into manas and your reckless conversions. So I would guess maybe that's, maybe that's what's going on here. And you just bring those in. We need, you need a more diverse threat to, uh, to take on the opponent, but interesting sideboard choices, but obviously a very cool, very strong deck. And I also like the choice of storm tyrants. I not a card. I see every, every riot material deck, but when your opponent hasn't pushed enough damage on you, this can just find the sort of the one card you need to keep going. And I think that's, I think that's really cool. So um, great deck from Sean, great showing getting Fire Eye into the top cut because it is good to see just for the diversity of the metagame that Fire Eye still has what it takes. Um, let's take a look at what the price of a Fire Eye deck is. So once again, looking at our optimized card of the Fire Eye deck here, you're going to see another wonderful price, 148 with the estimated shipping in there. Um, not too bad. The cost really coming from dungeon guides. Uh, again, we are running Quicksilver Grail and, uh, Grand Crusaders Ring. The Grand Crusaders Ring and the board, so this can actually go down to like a hundred, uh, what, 115, 113 bucks if you take that Grand Crusaders Ring out of the board, which I don't think is necessary. You do have a little bit of extra price from like Rex Reckless Conversions, which are still $8 cards. Um, again, those guides, but... Ah, uh, really? That's kind of it. Not a lot else here really costs a lot. You know, a lot of these cards are in like Rye Starter Deck stuff. It's just not not very expensive uh, to get a hold of these things. So um, if you take out that sideboarded Grand Crusaders ring, this is actually the cheapest deck that you can play um, in the in the top cut of the metagame from Ascent Houston. Uh, definitely a wonderful choice. And if you're looking for a a more the, the most sort of the most budget deck you can get. Um, if you just sacrifice that sideboard slot, slot in something else, fourth piece for reunion or something. Um, I don't think you would feel like you're missing a ton from that. And you are going to be able to kind of get some good performances in competitive grand archives. So once again, link to that down in the description below. If you want to just buy the list, boom, one shot, go ahead and pull this up. You can pull out the ring from there if you don't want to buy that and get your cheap $110 fully competitive, ready to go Ascent Houston proven deck. All right, so the last three decks we're looking at are all versions of Merlin, and we're going to start with the Fire Merlin deck that top cut with Matthew Greaves and Eason Chen's uh, amazing build here. It's actually, a lot of this looks initially just like a very standard Fire Merlin deck, um, but the addition of Slay the King was the hot tech that they showed everyone that weekend uh, is definitely a, a, a card that you need to be considering for these Merlin decks because it does some very, very cool stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff I'll talk about in just a sec, but you know, we're using deer, we're using fireball. That's your fire Merlin build. That's like, that's what it is. You're going to try and draw a million cards using cards like ghost of Pendragon, spirit blade, Ascension, crux sight. You put down a deer with incarnate majesty, and then you finish the game with fireballs as you need to. Otherwise it runs the usual suspects hasties with, uh, creative shocks, discards of your uh, floating memory. We're running fast cure to respect the aggro decks. Stalwart Shieldmate to respect the aggro decks. Um, it's just going to sort of control that early game turbo on up to uh, to level three using dungeon guides and floating memory plays, and then draw a million cards and establish a control of the board. The tech with Slay the King is very cool. Obviously, against a lot of decks, you're just going to be able to do four or six damage with Merlin level three's damage buff at the opponent, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at for a two cost attack. However, where it gets really cool is with this class bonus, the on attack, you can banish a card from your material deck. If you do, it gains on kill. You may play the banished card. So if you use this to kill an opponent's creature, you get to play a card out of your material deck. Now you still have to pay any costs, but there are some extremely good targets for this that you must be aware of. Uh, one of my favorite plays is that the, like the Rye deck we just looked at is looking to use Dungeon Guide 
to level up very quickly. And Dungeon Guide becomes a liability. When you get to, to level 3, you use Slay the King, Killing Dungeon Guide, then putting into play the Tithe Proclamation that you would have not had time to play before otherwise, suddenly putting a damper on Fire Eyes play if he does not have that Disintegrate readily available. He is not going to be able to go off necessarily the next turn, which is just going to, it's going to give you all the time you need to go ahead and finish him off. So um, very cool. I love that. Otherwise, you can use Slay the King to put Prismatic Edge into play, to put sort of Avarice into play, just to get some extra value for the turn. Um, again, this is doing the thing where like you put two cards down to play Slay the King. Then when you play sort of Avarice or Prismatic Edge, you lose those two cards to get the new thing, which is sort of just extending your turn. If it's sort of Avarice, it is extending your turn, letting you draw two more cards and then keep doing things, maybe find uh, another uh, Spirit Blade Ascension and then put that card right back in and take another sword out, draw more cards. Maybe find a Ghost of Pendragon, put the Ghost in, put the sword back in so that you can slay the king again next turn. These combos are very cool. Like, I love this exploration of Slay the King, and this is what really makes the deck stand out to me. So huge shout out to those guys for coming up with very, very cool tech. Um, and otherwise, you know, bringing just a solid, solid Fire Merlin deck uh, to the table. And now just a couple other things to mention here, just in the, in the sideboard. Again, they, we're seeing this in a lot of these decks. This one does Grand Crusaders ring in the main and then Quicksilver in the side, but bringing in Quicksilver Lantern is a good way to try and put the damper on the, uh, spoiler alert, the erupting Rhapsody and the rending flames style of decks. Uh, another resolute stand, another disintegrate, some sparkle giving you either some necessary ally kill or the ability to pierce through spell shield arcanes, water barriers, I guess, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we have the Beast Spawn Boots, which is just another way to just sort of shore up the Rai matchup, just try and stop Rai from dealing too much damage to you. Can obviously be a very useful card to have. Um, it, you you know, you have to have a beast in play, but guess who the beast is? Majestic Spirit. So very, very cool. Uh, that is the Fire Merlin deck. So let's now, at this point, the cost is going to go up a little bit. Let's go ahead and look at the cost for this deck. All right. So here you see, even after optimizing the cart, we have a total of $292, which again, compared to some other competitive TCGs, um, and I'm looking at you flesh and blood for this one. This is a no, nothing held back, full competitive deck, $292. Could be better, could be worse. So um, in this case, where does the cost come from and where could you cut it down? Look no further than Ghosts of Pendragon here. Is this is the this is the reason, guys. This is the reason this deck costs as much as it does. If it weren't for these Ghosts of Pendragon, this deck would be barely more expensive than any of the other decks that we saw. But right now, Ghosts of Pendragon is holding at $30 a card, which is pretty crazy, but I mean makes sense given the power level of ghosts. Otherwise, a lot of the stuff in here, dungeon guides, again, there's the ring. A, there's the grail, but some incarnate majesties, they're 11 bucks. Like that is, you know, that's a little bit too. Um, but nothing else is too crazy. It's really just like the addition of those incarnates. Otherwise this would be just as cheap as like fire Lorraine and stuff. So, um, those ghosts of Pendragon, man, that's like, if this can just go down in price a little bit, very affordable deck. As long as this is $30, you have to spend 120 bucks just to get those. It's pretty expensive. But if you like the style of deck, again, like I said, compared to some other TCGs, that is not the worst thing in the world, but this also just currently is not the most budget deck to play. So just keep that in mind. Um, once again, if you do really like this deck and you don't, you're like, I don't care. I just want to buy them. Link is down in the description. Go ahead and check it out. Maybe you already have some ghosts of Pendragon. Put the, use the link and then pull the ghosts out of there and pull the ring out, whatever you don't need, and just grab the rest. You're all done. So that is uh, $292 for the Fire Merlin deck. All right. Now we're going to look at the rumored, the fabled, the infamous Mexico deck from Jason May Limelight on the Discord server, mod on the Facebook group and everywhere. Uh, Limelight, a guy who is uh, sort of everybody's friend, as long as you're not being a total jerk to everybody. Um, our uh, our good friend from Australia made the trip up and he and Amy, shout out to both of them. They're wonderful people who both made it into top 32, which was super cool. Um, unfortunately, I did get paired against Amy and it was a good matchup for me. So um, I, I sort of was part of the reason she didn't quite make top cut like Jason did, but also congrats on the recent marriage guys. Super cool. And you guys, you guys are kind of like the, the number one married couple playing grand archive. So that's really cool. But Jason brought what he called Mexico, which is his win Merlin list. This is a very, very, um, very interesting Merlin build. 
I think there have been a lot of like win Merlin lists, but the thing with Merlin is you have so many directions you can go that it's tough to necessarily decide on a particular route to go. And the route Jason went is sort of a full bunker down protection build. Just grind out the game as long as it takes, win game one, and then draw out game two if necessary. And that is a valid strategy. So uh, here, of course, we have our basic Merlin list with Majestic Spirit and then some swords and a ring and some, some prismatic things. We, of course, run Ventus because Ventus is a crazy powerful regalia from Fractured Crown. Uh, that gives you a ton of flexibility with the deck. The full crux package you expect, except no Slay the Kings here. I kind of wonder if um, Slay the King would be something interesting to try in this deck as well. It's just such, it's got such powerful play to it that it's kind of hard not to, I think, especially if you're already running Ghosts of Pendragon. Only three on the Ghosts here, though, because we have a lot of room devoted to just not dying to things. This is the deck that's supposed to go against the aggro decks and go, nah, you're not, you're not killing me. So, Fairy Whispers. Uh, which obviously works great with Ventus, Veiling Breeze, and Blanche, and Stalwart Shieldmate, Ace and Protectors for the defense. We'll talk about the Anthem Vitality in just a second. It's a very cool card. Editing Dan here, and you know it's Editing Dan because I've got the headphones on. Uh, I did not actually go back and talk about Anthem Vitality. I just forgot to. So uh, here is my attempt to explain this to you. This is a one of spicy tech card. Jason's talked about how they were playtesting a lot against Fire Rye, and this is here for a very particular reason. In Fire Rye matchups, if you can get Majestic Spirit down, it gives champions you control Spell Shroud, which is great because then Fire Rye can't kill you. But the problem is that Majestic Spirit does not have Spell Shroud itself, so it's weak to Disintegrates and Fireballs and all that nonsense. So Anthem Vitality is in there as specifically an answer to Fire Rye because it gives uh, your Majestic Spirit Spell Shroud when they go to Disintegrate the Majestic Spirit. They're often going to use Disintegrate because it's slow speed, which means that Anthem can respond to that, give it Spell Shroud, and now they can't unless they happen to have fireball for 10, like already set up to be able to respond to the Anthem with, uh, that means their majestic spirits going to live that turn. And then that means they're going to live that turn because they have spell shroud too. Um, please note does not work against erupting Rhapsody. Erupting Rhapsody is a skill, not a spell. So erupting Rhapsody gets around this. Um, it again, just another point I keep to, I'm going to talk about more a little bit later in the video, but, uh, a point for our triple threat deck, just having kind of diversity of answers to things. Um, but this one of is in here. If he's facing Rai, he wants to find it and hold it and just use it to try and have the sort of the ace in the hole on the Majestic Spirit to survive a Rai turn to go for the kill the following turn. That's what it's there for. Uh, disorienting wins, uh, great against other Majestic Spirits, great just to uh, bounce stuff on the board, you know, bounce whatever you need to. Um, bounce the Blanche into, maybe, I wonder if you ever did this. You could, I guess you could bounce the Blanche, it bounce the Blanche into your hand, draw the card, and then have the Blanche to kind of play on your opponent's turn, keeping it safe from certain things. So it only comes down when the sort of the kill spell happens. That's probably like a reasonable play, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Displace, which does similar stuff to that. Displace does everything. Displace does so many things. Uh, it's just, it's sick. Um, Dream Fairies, another great card against getting rid of deer for the turn so you can win. Favorable wins. Hurricane Sweeps. I like the choice of the two Hurricane Sweeps in here. Even though we're not running Lorraine level two, that's okay because Hurricane Sweep with Merlin's ability to get plus two damage and a sword is four damage. That is enough. That's the kind of the threshold you want to hit on your Hurricanes, on your cleave attacks to be able to take the opponent out of the game. Uh, reclaims in here again, doing, you know, tricks with Blanche and Ace and Protectors and Shieldmates and Dream Fairies. Bouncing Dream Fairy, of course, that's really good. Uh, Swift Recruits, more Intercept, more good stuff. Tactful Sergeant. I like this in here a lot. This is I think this is a card you wouldn't necessarily put in if you're not running a ton of attacks, but you know, you have enough. You have the Sword of Seeking. The Sword of Seeking is actually enough to be able to justify the Tactful Sergeant, I think. Um, just puts a body on the board and keeps your card flow going. It lets you commit some cards. You can level up, keep cards coming in. Um, and then it has good tricks with, you know, using Displace uh, to draw extra cards later turns, reclaiming it and doing it again. Just part of this package of just, I'm going to go long. I'm going to keep my card flow going and stop you from killing me over and over again. And then, of course, we have Zephyr. Zephyr is a very flexible card, super useful in tons of uh, tons of reasons. Not only projecting protecting your own Majestic Spirit, um, but getting rid of your opponent's Majestic Spirit. 
blinking out a sword that's been honed by fire a bunch so that it can't the opponent can't get that huge rending flames on you. Um, Zephyring any number of allies. It just does everything. And all there's so many mage spells in your Zephyr, Reclaim, uh, Favorable Winds, Displace, uh, Disorienting Winds, and uh, Veiling Breeze. No, that's Assassin. Sorry, not that one. Fire Fairy Whispers. All those are going to trigger Ventus, giving you, it again, just constant card draw or the Suppress off of Ventus as well, which lets you get around Spell Shroud uh, enemies, um, Spell Shroud allies, so enemy enemy allies. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the build. Again, it's just supposed to go long, just supposed to grind out the game. But he does sideboard into these Phalanx Captains, which I think is really cool. It goes, you know what? In this game, I need to actually push damage. And this, I think, I think hearing him talk about it too, this is a play you can do. You can, if you end up losing the first game for some reason, and your t- your clock isn't on your side now, you can side in the Phalanx Captains. And with the combination of Captains and Banner Sergeants, or Tactful Sergeants and uh, Ace and Protectors, you can just kind of go an aggro game instead and go like, well, I need to get a win here to at least tie the game. So you can start just pushing aggro instead. Now, unfortunately, while Jason did an incredible job making it a top cut with this super cool Merlin build, he didn't quite see what he needed to see against Jimmy playing Fire Lorraine and did lose in the top cut uh, in the in the top eight game. So um, it is a wonderful deck. And honestly, that's a matchup where I think he felt pretty favored too. Um, I think if he had seen the right stuff, he maybe could have pulled through and gone quite a bit farther with it. Uh, but very cool deck. Amazing job. Shout out to Limelight again. Wonderful job with this deck. And let's just go ahead and talk about the cost of a deck like this. And if you saw the Ghost of Pendragon, you can probably guess where this is going. So we're not going to belabor the point too much here because this cost is almost identical to the Fire of the Rain one. And that's because it's running a lot of the same stuff and a lot of the the different cards, the win cards, are just uh, cheap cards. So it doesn't really matter that much. Your cost is purely from having a bunch of Crux stuff that's expensive in here. Um, in this case, we're in a few like $3 Blanches instead. But otherwise, you know, we got our Incarnate Majesties and we have our Ghost of Pendragon. So that's uh, there it is. There's Ghost of Pendragon in there. Um, that's where the cost is coming from, just like in the last one. Otherwise, nothing in here is too expensive. It's all just, it's, it's all kind of what you expect. Very similar to the last build. Yeah. So you're looking at about a $300 deck right now. If Ghost of Pendragon ever goes down significantly, um, it can go a lot closer down to 200. Um, if you already have Ghost of Pendragon, it's 200 just to build it. Um, and I think again, that price is really just kind of held up a little bit by just a bunch of like two, three, four dollar cards, uh, and then a Grand Crusader's Ring and some dungeon guides. So uh, that's what you're looking at there. Not a lot to say, very similar to the last one. Um, but again, if you want to build this deck, we've got the link down in the description. All right. And finally, our ninth place triple threat fire hybrid deck list running both Merlin level three and Lorraine level three. I really am. I think it's very unfortunate that we didn't make it into top cut. Um, now we've looked at all the different deck lists and here's kind of how I think I would have fared if my tiebreakers had got me into top cut instead, um, against Caben's win Lorraine deck. Uh, I think that we would have been favored in that matchup. What this deck does and the difference between this Merlin deck and the other Merlin lists is that we are running, uh, we are running erupting Rhapsody and we are, uh, just going all in on trying to do a ton of damage, make it very difficult for the opponent to win the game, including things like playing increasing dangers early, just draw a lot of cards. Now, it's obviously a dangerous play because your opponent gets more to work with too, but the key is that we're going to be able to use our cards like Ember Song and Erupting Rhapsody as well as use our Honed by Fires with our swords as we need to to control the game. The reason this deck is so powerful is it's very difficult to pin down, um, and when we sideboard into the Flame Sweeps and go to Lorraine level 2, um, rather than the Merlin route, we have, have even more ways to just keep control of the board on the opponent, and we win by just going late. The only crux cards we play are the Sights and the Ascensions because once we get to that late game, we're just going to draw a million cards and then we're going to combo off in the opponent whatever way we need to. Now, pretty much every deck, as you saw in the top eight, was playing the things like Nullifying Lantern and Quicksilver Grail, which in theory provide stumbling blocks to us. But with again, with that ability to draw a lot of cards and running four mainboard Varrican Acolytes and two more Disintegrates out of the side, we have lots of ways of ultimately getting rid of those. Plus... Merlin doesn't care that much about those. Uh, Merlin will eventually get a high enough level where you don't need to banish anything with Erupting Rhapsody to do fireball damage with it. And you can totally just win the game by getting nine cards in hand and going Ember Song, Erupting Rhapsody, Fireball after you've dealt a little bit of damage to your opponent, or maybe not at all. So um, 
It also can win super fast. It can do the turn two kills because it uses, it has the full suite of increasing danger for clumsies um, and cremation ritual to be able to do turn ones where we draw a bunch of cards, get to enough cards in hand to turn two, just go double honed by fire. Rending flames, take the opponent out and the decks like the win the rain decks are staying on level one for a long time. He has to, at level one, he has to put out, uh, turn two has to put out that nullifying lantern. Um, and if he doesn't, he is in danger of just losing the game. He might have interceptors that those always are a little wrench and things, but we also have ways to deal more damage than that too. So, um, it can go fast or it can go long. It can play control or it can just combo off. It's a deck that can go whatever route it needs to. And it's highlighted by the fact that it runs both Merlin and Lorraine level threes to have that full adaptability. You can do whatever you need to do to try and get that win. Against the Fire Lorraine deck, again, I, as I mentioned, Jimmy is the one who took me out uh, of my my sure thing in Top Cut. I lost to him in the Day 2 Top 32 matches, um, and that matchup is, is very difficult. Um, it is it is a matchup that we can win because we can go just as fast or faster. We can get some control pieces, but we don't run any of the protection. We don't, As you see, we don't have Resolute Stands in here. We don't have any of that because our, our answer is just to try and go faster in general. If I faced Jimmy in Top 8 there's definitely a chance we would have just been knocked out. Um, whereas I, I like my matchup a little bit more against any of the wind decks in top eight instead. Fire Rye, the Sean, Sean's Fire Rye deck, I think this deck would have probably lost to. Um, we did not have quite the right tech. I really like the Slay the King tech we saw from the Fire Merlin deck, and I'm going to be incorporating that into the next build of this because that gives you the ability to get that extra Tithe Proclamation turn. We'll just end up pulling one of the cards out. Might be the Sword of Adversity. It might be the Crystal of Empowerment. Something will be pulled out from uh, from the Material deck to put in Tithe Proclamation, or it'll go on the sideboard, not totally sure. Um, and then being able to get that Slay the King off to get the Tithe Proclamation the turn you level up gives you exactly what you need to survive to beat Rai in more matchups. Otherwise, we can go faster if all the cards come up right, but they don't always come up right. So um, that matchup, I'd say, is favored towards Fire Rai. Uh, against the Fire Merlin deck, I played several Fire Merlin decks that day, and I like our odds. We go a little bit faster than Fire Merlin. We, um, well, I'd say we level at about the same speed, but we are way more explosive at the top end. We just, we, we, instead of having to grind out a few turns with deer and some attacks, we just kill their deer and then explode on their face with erupting Rhapsody. So, um, that's all you really need to do. That's, that's the game plan. And we're running the four Varrican Acolytes main board. This is actually, this is really the clutch card in the Fire Merlin matchup, because what you want to do is answer their sword the turn before they level. If you answer the sword before they level, then they have to take extra time to level to start going off, which buys you enough time too. Um, so that uh, that is a card. If you see that, that really helps that matchup quite a bit. And then against Jason's Win Merlin deck, um, I would that would have been such a fun matchup. Um, I think we are favored. I think we're favored because despite the fact that he runs all the protection, we are running Merlin, we're fire Merlin, we're going to go late and we have more ways to go over the top. He's going to go late anyway. Any of the decks like Wind Merlin that try and they dirtle a little bit, they just spend time kind of spinning wheels and getting getting material deck stuff out. That gives us time to sculpt a gigantic hand to find all our combo pieces. And then when we do go off, it's more damage than Veiling Breeze and Blanche can really prevent. Um... We also have, you know, the main board Varricans will answer Ventus and will make it difficult for him to establish a lot of card draw. Um, and we won't have a lot of things for him to attack. He'll just have to attack in a face if he wants to do tactful sergeant plays, and we're not going to just care about that that much. So I like that matchup. I would have liked to play that one. I think that would have been interesting if we had gotten paired in the top eight. Um, I feel like we would have, been, would have been favored, but Lime's an incredible player and certainly had the possibility to pull it out too. So... Um, that's kind of how I think this deck would have done. Again, overall, I think like generally good matchups. I just don't like Fire Lorraine and Fire Rye as much, but I think this deck can be tweaked uh, in order to expand that. If you want to hear my full deep dive on exactly how to play this deck, there's like a 40 minute video I did last week on that. Uh, link will be in the description for that too. Let's talk about the price of this one now. Now, unlike the other Merlin decks, we are actually coming at under $200 because we are not running Ghosts of Pendragon. We are not running the Quicksilver Amulet. There's a bunch of things we just don't have that cost money. Um, really, again, this price is just going to come from that Grand Crusader's Ring. And then in this case, uh, we are running some rares that are a little bit more expensive. Erupting Rhapsodies do clock in at a little bit, almost $5 each. 
We do have that place at a dungeon guide, but that's really where most of that money comes from. Again, it's like a lot of set one stuff. If you have it already, this deck is not expensive to build. If you don't have it, this deck is still not that expensive, all things considered. Certainly a good option if you're looking for one. I think this is a deck that, <laughs> you know, again, despite the fact that everybody's playing things like Nullifying Lantern, they don't matter that much and you have answers to them. You're able to get through. You're able to deal with things. I get through Fracturized Nullifying Lanterns just fine from water decks. I don't really care that much. This deck is good. This deck should be considered. And when you're looking at your, um, when you're looking at a deck to take to store champs or regionals, I think you need to consider this deck, tweak it to your liking, uh, you know, go ahead and, and mess around with slay the King, get those dungeon guides. I think in the main, I think you want more than two, the two that we ran in the main, but otherwise modify this deck as you need to, and take it to your store champs or regionals and see how you do. Because really the, the big thing is that you are so difficult to pin down. And uh, you will just have an advantage against a lot of decks right out of the main because you always have the ability to just go off above all of their protection, above all of their interaction, and take them out of the game. So um, again, 168 bucks, great price, and really shows that uh, overall there were only uh, three decks out of the top nine that cost more than $200. Everything else was less than $200. Um, so it's uh, with it with a bottom of, of 148 or actually the fire arriving about a 113 if you don't want to put that Grand Crusaders ring in the sideboard. So really, I think this shows that Grand Archive is quite an affordable game to play competitively. There are a lot of decks you can play and a variety of decks you can play that come in at cheaper costs and some decks that come in a little bit higher if you like their style of play, but also not necessarily the ones that I think that um, you need to be playing. As far as going to this, this upcoming metagame, I would say that actually the best decks to play right now are the ones that are cheaper. I like playing the Wind and Fire aggro decks. Um, I think Fire Xander, Fire Lorraine uh, versions that go to level 3 and Wind Lorraine versions that go to level 3 are less explored. However, those Lorraine ones might be more expensive because they're going to play Ghost of Pendragon probably. Um, and Rai is always going to be a wild card that you can win games with and is going to be possibly the cheapest deck you can build as well. Um, I hope you guys found this an interesting exploration. I know I've said this a million times. I'm just going to say it one more time for you guys. The links to purchase these decks are down in the description below. You can go ahead and purchase them through our links to support main deck um, or just purchase cards through our generic link, which is also in the description, to support main deck as well. Really appreciate that from all you guys. Um, we will have plenty more Grand Archive content coming. We're going to be talking about Proxy's Vault very soon. We're going to be showing off some more fun deck lists. Now that we're on the scent, we're going to get out some more goofy fun deck lists we've been played. I've been working on a Water Sylvie that I really enjoy quite a bit. Um, so there's going to be some more deck lists coming, as well as we're going to, of course, get hopefully involved in the spoiler season for Alchemical Revolution Set 3 whenever that starts. So stay tuned for more great Grand Archive content. Hope you guys enjoyed that one, and we will see you in the next one.